which attracted admiration or ridicule. He is represented above all as a man of style. In the process of receiving and perpetuating this image, we have paid little attention to his possibilities as a man of substance beyond the mere display. And for the rest of my talk, this is just what I'd like to represent. Far from seeing Cullen Mann as a stereotype, I want to present him as an archetype, as a model, and one driven by the positive desire for self-improvement, one dying to better himself. This model of Cullen Mann will more accurate accurately portray the story of our forefathers and foremothers who literally fought the elements to create a better life for themselves and their children. I say grandmothers and grandfathers, I say grandfathers and grandmothers, for often ignored in the narrative is a female alternative to the male archetype. And yes, there is one, though she wasn't the topic of song. Women of all descriptions went to Panama. They worked as maids, laundresses, seamstresses, cooks, bakers, and in the sexual service industries. They were wives of elite men, they were hotel keepers, merchants and traders, teachers and other white collar workers, especially um, the latter during the US construction days. But the Cullen woman who became an iconic figure was none other than a very familiar occupational and social type, the Higler or itinerant vendor. From the time of the Panama Railroad, we see her imprinting herself on the consciousness of foreign visitors who described, painted, and later photographed the persistent image of a black Jamaican woman with a tray on her head full of cooked meals, vegetables, fruit, ground provisions, or cool drinks to sell as she walked about or sat on the city pavements just as she had done at home. Thus, those 20th century Higglers who started this skeleton run to Panama in the 1970s and 80s were simply recycling a long established practice. And um, in, in my book, I refer to the fact that the first famous Higgler was in fact Mary Seacole, who, um, check her autobiography, her brother had a little hotel during the gold rush in Panama, um, and she went to visit him. And in her autobiography, she tells of how she, um, before that, at her hotel, which is, I think, on this location or very nearby on East Street, she had people making up little trousers and shirts and making guava jelly and all the things that she was taking to sell in Panama. And so, in a way, um, she knew, Neri Seacole knew, that food, clothing, and other personal goods were in great demand on an isthmus which at the time was lacking in all such facilities. There was absolutely nothing there except for this railroad that they were trying to build across the isthmus. But she was not an isolated case of entrepreneurship for women like their men on the isthmus were willing to turn their hands to anything in a place that offered an opportunity to make a living. And making a living was what it was all about. If they couldn't do it at home, they would try their hand abroad, and a large section of the population did. The earlier migrants left at a time when the former British colonies of the Caribbean were at their lowest ebb, with the abandonment of sugarcane fields and factories their former mainstay. The derelict condition of Jamaica's capital city at the mid-19th century, as described by, by visitors, conveys the squalid conditions and the inertia of the times and I'll quote a little. Neglect and apathy greet one everywhere. There's nothing new in Kingston. The people like their horses, their houses, and all that belongs to them look old and worn. Kingston looks like what it is, a place where money has been made but can be made no more. It is used up and cast aside as useless. Nothing is replaced that time destroys. If a brick tumbles from a house to the street, it remains there. Have I described a God-forsaken place in which no one seems to take an interest, without life and without energy, old and dilapidated, sickly and filthy, cast away from the anchorage of sound morality, of reason, and of common sense? This was um, a few years before the Moran, after the Moran, no, 1860s. In the stagnant world, 
the fall from grace of, of what was once Britain's richest colony, there was simply no work to be had, and what there was hardly provided a living wage. So as soon as news arrived that working men and women were wanted, everyone who could rushed to the boats. The calls came from South and Central America as American capitalists began to invest there in railroads, banana plantations, rubber and mahogany, among other things. But it was Panama that imprinted itself on the Jamaican imagination from the beginning, the proximity and ease of travel to that country which led to long-standing connections. Long before the Republic of Panama or the city of Colón came, Colón came to exist, Jamaica was indeed a hub for traffic to and from the narrow neck of land called the Isthmus of Panama and further along the Central American coast to what is called the Spanish Main. From the early 16th century, Jamaica was supplying goods to the new colony of Panama on the Pacific coast, leading to the establishment of long-standing trading and other connections between the two countries. And as an aside, I should say that um, the, the um, Spanish conquistador Balboa um, was the one who, who traveled across Panama and discovered the Pacific Ocean, and that this was just a narrow bit of land, land linking two oceans. He, um, like many of the Spanish, um, Jamaica is in a Spanish colony, and like many people setting sail for the mainland, he stopped off in Jamaica to get supplies, which included um, horses, livestock, lard, and cassava bami. So in a way, we were there from the start, 15, 15, 14, I think it was. Up to the early 20th century, Jamaica was dubbed the gateway to Panama because of its central location within the Caribbean basin. As I mentioned earlier, only 550 miles northeast of Colón. And with a favorable trade wind in the days of sail, a schooner could make it down in a week. And um, with the steamships, I think it was about 36 hours. As rival European nations battled for supremacy in the hemisphere, the English colony of Jamaica occupied a central position for military exploits, trading voyages, and pirate attacks on Spanish, Dutch, and French territory in the region, exploits which included names such as Henry Morgan sailing from Port Royal for his infamous sack of the city of Panama in 1670. Turtle fishermen, logwood cutters, and traded from Jamaica eventually formed settlements on the Caribbean coast from as early as the 18th century in Bocas del Toro, Panama, the Mesquita coast of Nicaragua, and the Talamanca coast of Costa Rica, among others. Wives and children followed, and Jamaicans and other Caribbean folk did what they continued to do in these lands for the next centuries. They took a piece of land, planted a ground and put down roots. Their numbers augmented from them onwards by wage laborers for the banana plantations, railway construction, rubber and mahogany interests, industries and so on. Which is why even today in Nicaragua or Costa Rica or other parts of the coast, as in Panama, you find Jamaican foods, accents, cultural practices and churches. But it was the Isthmus of Panama that had the aura of riches and reverberated in people's minds. During Spanish times, the treasure from Peru to Spain traveled across the Isthmus jungles over what became known as the Gold Road, which ended on the Caribbean coast, where the treasure was again put on ships for Europe. So for centuries, Panama was associated in popular imagination as a place where gold was to be found. When later the workers who had gone to Panama came home with gold teeth, gold rings, gold watch, gold-headed walking stick, and the golden glow of success, Panama gold was confirmed. And the stereotype image of Colon Man or Panama Man was born. Unknown or forgotten or pushed to the back of the mind was the reality of what they confronted in Panama. And let me hasten to say I'm not talking about the Panama, which exists today as a healthy, prosperous, thriving republic. No, the Panama I am talking about was long before that. An inhospitable, unsettled region <coughs> of mountains, jungles, swamps, alligators, poisonous snakes, 
no roads, no settlements of any size outside of Panama City, torrential rain and mud for six months of the year, and accompanying disease and unhealthiness, yellow fever, malaria, typhoid, dysentery, and cholera. This historic Panama was a place that definitely had to be tamed, and the people of the West Indies would have a major role in taming it, starting with the Panama Railroad, and in the process, suf suffering enormous loss of life. Back here. <laughs> yeah, okay, thanks. A migration pattern was established at that time that was to continue. Good times that lasted for a while, then ended in a cycle of boom and bust. By the time of the French Canal effort, there were some improvements to the island on the co Crown Colony government, but push factors continued to be lack of work, lack of opportunity for the vast majority. Bananas were now the big thing, but it was less labor, labor intensive, sorry, intensive than sugar and under control of the large fruit companies. By this time, Jamaica was a hub for steamships from America and England heading to and from Latin American ports. This might sound familiar. They came for coal and water and dropped off tourists who came in increasing numbers on the banana boats. 17 steamship lines offered passage to Cologne. No passport or papers were required and passage was cheap for those who would travel on deck, as many did. Often, when there was a demand for workers, recruiters would offer free passage. During the French Canal effort, Jamaican emigrants to Cologne were joined for the first time by large numbers from, from other West Indian islands, especially from St. Lucia, Martinique, and Barbados. But the, the bulk of Barbadians went during the um, US construction era. When the French company finally collapsed, over 7,000 Jamaicans had to be repatriated. Many returned home on their own and some stayed on in Panama, and then others went to other places in Latin America. The cycle of boom followed by bus continued to take its toll. Many who stayed behind were enmeshed in destitution and penury, and a small number continued to work on the French Canal and the Panama Railroad. Um, the French so continued work on the canal in a small way in order to keep the concession they had from Colombia, and they sold it to the Americans um, in 1903. Um, and so came the construction of the Panama Canal by the Americans, again, offering the opportunity for work. The ironic ending of the epic voyage to find gold in Panama was that workers on the US Canal ended their days as silver men. The designation given to them on the racially segregated canal zone where the terms black and white were never used. Instead, white Americans were on the gold roll from the metal in which they were paid. Non-white workers were paid in silver. They're on the silver roll and called silver men. And they were paid substantially less even when they were doing the same work. And actually, um, anyway, 